This week, Jonathan Frakes, a.k.a. Will Riker, and Elizabeth Dennehy, a.k.a. Elizabeth Shelby, chat with me about the shocking events of this week's episode. We explore the beautiful Enterprise D bridge set, and we commemorate Frontier Day with a look back at the crew of the first Enterprise. Step through the mysterious door and into the ready room for all this and more. Hey nerds, I'm Will Wheaton and this is The Ready Room, your official behind the scenes hub for all things Star Trek Universe. This week's episode of Star Trek Picard titled Vox commemorates Starfleet's founding with a Galactic Frontier Day party. But in case your invitation got lost in subspace, I am calling for a red alert. Those collective voices you're hearing in your mind, they're full of spoilers, but resistance is not futile. If you haven't seen this week's episode, then say hello to your favorite chair, stream it, and then beam back here to the ready room. I'm so excited that Jonathan Frakes and Elizabeth Dennehy, who play Will Riker and Elizabeth Shelby, are here to chat with me about their experiences battling the Borg for three decades and what being an unforgettable part of Star Trek has meant to each of them. Speaking of Admiral Shelby, she of course returns to Star Trek in this week's episode as part of the Frontier Day celebrations, which mark the 250th anniversary of the first Starship Enterprise's historic missions. Later, we'll take a look back at the long road the Enterprise NX-01 traveled, setting the stage for the founding of the United Federation of Planets and what we now know as Starfleet. But before we get to any of that, this week, Jordy LaForge surprises his friends when he reveals that he has spent the last 20 years restoring their beloved USS Enterprise, NCC-1701-D. I have to say, seeing that bridge again felt like a homecoming to me, and I imagine it did for you too. I recently joined legendary Star Trek graphic designer Mike Okuda for a tour of that recreated bridge set. And let me tell you, it was very much coming home. It is just like I remember it, down to every last detail, and I cannot wait to share it with you. Control room, engage. This is kind of the way Wesley Crusher first experienced the Bridge of the Enterprise D, and it is the first way adult Will Wheaton is getting to experience the Bridge of the Enterprise D. Uh, this is Mike Okuda. Mike is responsible for all of the graphic design. Um, Mike invented L cars. We're going to talk about that today. Mike, let's start at the science stations. Perfect. I think L cars is amazing. I remember you talking about the software, the, the system being software control and the system responding to the person who was using it. When I was first starting to lay out the bridge, I had a meeting with Gene, and I said, here's what I want to do. I, I want to riff off of what Matt Jeffries did right. in the original Star Trek. Yeah. And Gene, to his very considerable credit, said, I don't want to do what we did in the first show. I want this to be different. I want the show to be so advanced that it's really simple. Mm -hmm. And that's really the genesis of this. Now, Star Trek Next Generation, we had just shot our first scene on the battle bridge. Yes. And you could tell um, Marina was a little nervous about, uh, about working the controls. Right. And I said to Marina, look, these buttons are software defined. The, the layout is software defined. It responds to your training, to your needs, to what's happening right now. So the button that you press is the correct button. Just remember that. Let's go to tactical. Let's go fire some phasers. Let's fire some phasers. Let's talk about tactical. When you were putting this together, was this something you had to work closely or more closely, like with Herman or, or whoever was doing the physical shaping of this horseshoe, did that matter for you at all? Or was it just like, nope, the graphics are gonna lay in and it's gonna be great? Well, this is an incredibly complicated shape. It's, it's compound intersecting ellipses. Yeah. And uh, back in the day, the, the original version took literally weeks and weeks to, uh, to assemble. Yeah. Even uh, this version, art director Liz Kalaskowski and uh, set designer Kyle Corder mm -hmm. sweated these details because uh, before you can build it, you have to draw it, and you have to be able to, uh, to to dimension, and you have to figure out you know what the, what the angles are, and what are the what are the Bezier curves, and all those things. And these guys sweated the details. And look at that! Isn't this perfect? On the original version of this console, it was a it was a problem because it's it's relatively thin. It was it was actually too thin to put uh, to put fluorescence. So this uh, this particular panel was illuminated by uh, by neon lamps, 
which was a lot of power going through this. Yeah. And Jeff Mandel actually recreated this, this graphic for, uh, for, the, for this set. But notice how he's given it a slightly bluer tint than everything else here. That's part of the look of this set, and that's, uh, th that, that's what he recreated. I can't not see that now. Um, that is why this feels so perfect. Of course, because it's like there's neon light behind it. If we did it today... Which we did. Which we did. <laughs> We used, what did we put behind it? We used, uh, we used LED lamps. The Picard set lighting department uh, put all these wonderful, uh, uh, cool, color controllable LED arrays, and they used it to recreate the flaws of a 1987 television set. And the result is, you saw it when you stepped in here, it feels like you're coming home. And it's going home to a home that was torn down in 95. Yeah. And you'd like, you never thought you'd be there again. And you walked into here and suddenly it's there and it's, it's the way you remembered it. Let's go where that kid got to sit. All right. We're going to head down to a uh, con and office. But we are in my wheelhouse now. <laughs> Welcome to my office. <laughs> does it feel familiar? Yeah, it does. Um, if I recall correctly, if Picard was like, lay in a course for blah, 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 Mark, blah. And I would go, okay, blah, 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 Mark, blah, blah, blah. Great, course laid in. Terrific, take us to warp whatever. Okay, uh, warp seven, warp seven, course laid in. And that's how the ship went to warp speed. And I love that you used the framing bars. Now, do you have course and speed laid in? Yes, sir, they are. Standing here in front of this chair, I just had this wonderful, uh, like almost a flashback memory. When this set was on stage six for the pilot, we've been here for 25 minutes or something like that while the camera's set up. And I'm all kinds of not sitting in this chair. I notice you're not sitting because in the chair. Because there's a protocol. Because there are rules, right? So I texted the cast and I said, Ready Room wants me to sit in the chair. I need one of you to give me permission before I can do that. Brent replies, no, absolutely not. <laughs> and then a second later he says, what the hell, permission granted. I just got a text from Jonathan Frakes, who as it turns out is one stage over from us today. And Frakes said, Mr. Crusher, you have the bridge. There you go. So. Because Frakes gave me the bridge, would you please sit in my first officer's chair? I would be honored. Oh. That's On, nice too. It feels different than sitting in a chair, right? Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to everybody involved in everything that had to happen for me to be right here, right now. Helm, take us out of orbit. Lay in a course for the ready room set. I am so excited and so grateful to have our beloved Captain Will Riker, Jonathan Frakes, and now Admiral Elizabeth Shelby, Elizabeth Dennehy, here with me today to talk about Star Trek Picard's penultimate episode. Johnny, thank you for returning to the Ready Room. Pleasure's mine. Elizabeth, welcome back to Star Trek, almost 35 years later. What's it like being back? It's surreal. Yeah. Uh, I'm really grateful that um, the, sh the character of Shelby has lived in the imaginations of fans and that I was just saying to Jonathan that to get the call out of the blue was like, what? Crazy. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, we were talking before we started talking all of us kind of realizing at the same time, we don't think Shelby actually had a canonical first name back on Next Generation, right? Lieutenant Commander Shelby. That was yeah, all right? they, that was all she wrote. And so all Elis she needed. Yeah. <laughs> she, Lieutenant <laughs> Commander Badass. Yeah, Shelby. right. Thank you. And so Elizabeth works. Elizabeth yeah. Shelby. Shelby appeared in arguably two of the most important and consequential episodes of Next Generation, Beth's to Both Worlds Part One and Part Two, what making a her a <laughs> very memorable guest star. I intend to convince Captain Picard that I'm the right choice for the job. Job? Which job? Yours, of course. This season, we get 
some real big heavy hitter guest stars and cameos. I'm going to read some of them and ask you about them. Shelby. Very cool. Ro Laren. Also cool. Moriarty. Great idea. Tuvok. Right? Yeah. Surprising. Yeah. Did you expect to be reuniting with any of these characters? I had uh, no idea. I, Terry, who, who sort of teased me with the season, yeah. didn't tell me anything about who was going to be in it. As each of you returned to Star Trek, we had to revisit the character dynamics, especially between Ooh. Riker and Shelby, which is not so great. <laughs> There's still a little bit of so friction great. there. You'd do an end run around me again. I'll snap you back so hard you'll think you're a first year cadet again. May I speak frankly, sir? By all means. You're in my way. She didn't like Riker. You know, it's <laughs> it, it's very interesting because I had never watched any version of Star Trek before I got it. I was like, oh, you're Riker. Literally on the set. Like, so <laughs> clueless. But also, when we were shooting the first part, we had not seen the second part. We had absolutely... Nobody knew what the second part was going to be. One of my favorite stories ever is Michael Piller, who wrote those episodes, saying, I wasn't coming back for part two, so I just made it as bad as I could for them, and I'm going to let somebody else clean it up. And then Gene's like yo, I need you to come back and clean this up. And he was like, what do I do? Yeah, we had no idea where this was going, what was happening. And we had conversations about, we ha we have to play every kind of variable. So I would s tell people, that's why you would sometimes get some snotty little side eye from me, because are we going to end up hating each other yeah. or are we going to end up Having in love with together. each other or maybe and I'm... is Picard going to end up dead or a full-time Borg and not come back that's what it really felt like that's why the yeah. cliffhanger was so effective maybe because... I'm a double agent maybe I'm a Borg in disguise who's been taken over and put in a human body we had to play every eventuality planting the seeds for what could have come in the second part and we what did no come in Picard you could have easily been a Borg in Picard but for real I see Shelby on the view screen and I'm like I don't know, I don't know man. That, I'm exactly. thinking maybe she's a changeling. Like, I'm not, I super don't trust anybody. Yeah, yeah it's it, good writing. Star Trek has its own language. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we have our own techno babble. We have our own weird laws of physics. And every now and then we are tasked with extraordinary, difficult, and weird language things. Did your experience working on a soap opera where you don't get a ton of time with the material before it's <laughs> given to you, did that create a, a skill set that you were able to to draw upon to handle all of that techno babble? Very good question. Uh, the 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 soap opera I did, I was on the Guiding Light for a year with Michelle Forbes. Uh, what it did give me for my life is a facility for learning lines very very quickly. Okay. Um, uh, but what helped me with the techno babble was training in Shakespeare, actually. Okay. I think that uh, the vocal dexterity that is required in speaking verse. Uh, but there are lines that I will never forget. Do you want to say them? What's Separate that? the saucer section. Assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion. Separate the saucer section. Assign a skeleton crew to create a diversion. That line took me hours and hours and hours because you have to sound like you talk like this all the time. <laughs> We're looking at each other like, takes that's so, so much, easy. <laughs> it takes up so much real estate in my brain. It is going with me to my grave. I will never, ever forget that God line. forbid you have a civil and S. <sighs> exactly. Do you have a memory of, do you, is there a techno babble line that set up, set up space so in your head that won't leave? I was blessed leak? with not having to do techno babble with the exception of, it wasn't him, it never was, it was his assistant. It wasn't him, it never was, it was his assistant. <gasps> but generally- right. Where none have gone before. Where none have gone before. Generally, my participation in the Techno Babble scenes was report. <sighs> and then LeVar would take it or Brent would take it how and I'd go, Brent... and, I, and then I'd say, thank you. It was great, <laughs> it was so great. It was they... so easy. How do they do it? I would stand back in Brent, amazement. It's it's what you just said. It was it well was, for me anyway. It was it's it's a muscle and it's a meter and it's a tempo and it's just committing to it. Oh, this is a capable contravariant of a meander and tensor field. Like that's what and just over and over and over again until like yeah, it doesn't mean anything to me at all, but it feels right. Can I tell yes. you and before you go to bed you have to have it. That's the other thing. Can yeah. I tell you a secret? Yeah. I thought I was gonna be fired after my first day. I don't know if you remember this. I was horrible my first day. Really? Oh my God. 
Uh, projections suggest that a Borg ship like this one could continue to function effectively even if 78% of it were rendered inoperable. Could not say it. I could not say it. I mean, you're killing Still it now. I, I was going to well, say you're killing it I now. went home and I, cr I, I my oh first my day, God. I was terrible. No idea. I was terrible. I was terrible and I couldn't say it. The, my very first day, the very first scene, and when I, can, I can't even watch the show because I can see the terror in my eyes. I thought you were so cool. Oh. Calm and yeah, that was my... my so my, well cast. I have a very similar memory oh, that's so of, funny. of just presence, like, yeah. oh, she's cool and she's a badass. Oh, I thought and, I was like, going to be fired. I, I could not get the amazing. line out. Chris Paul directed it. And Chris, oh, he, he, was, was he was a love. He from was whom I the stole best. a lot. He he was elusively good. Did you have a good experience with Cliff Paul? He was one of the ones who really treated me like a person and not like a kid who could just be moved around by he the elbow. He had done hundreds of hours of television. Yeah, he yeah, and you felt it. Director, yeah. He yeah. gave me one of the best <laughs> acting notes I ever got in my life, and I don't know if you remember the scene where I say, I suppose this is why someone like you sits in the shadow of our big confrontation yeah. scene. And he said to me, because you were so much taller than me, he said, I know that you can't look him straight in the eye, but your strength can come, you can find a lot of strength from acting as if you can look him straight in the eye. And he said, so when you're like this, I suppose that's what, it looks like you're like a little kid looking up at a, at, he said, just square your shoulders and look at him as directly as you can and lower your voice. And when I did that, all of a sudden I felt taller. If you can't make the big decisions, Commander, I suggest you make room for someone who can. That's a great note. Fantastic note. I loved him. When we see Shelby and Riker sees Shelby, there's that moment of like... In case of the unthinkable fleet-wide incapacitation, this system will protect our crews in our continued exploration of what still remains, our final frontier. There it is. Right from the mouth of Admiral Elizabeth Shelby. The irony of her endorsing something so Borg-like. Happy Frontier Day, everyone. The huge reveal that the Borg figured out a way to, to get create into the a biological infection vector through the transporters. It's genius. It kind of retcons all this stuff in Star Trek over all these years. You can go back and look at these things and go and wonder, was that person being manipulated by the Borg and we don't also, know? Also, like, so little fun. All those little uh, blinking lights. What was in there? It turns out that could have been Borg-centric. Yeah. I love how everything is, there's follow through on everything. You know, there, you don't have a lot of red herrings. Like it's, you know, could conceivably be true. So some of us are maybe holding out a little bit of hope that maybe Shelby wasn't blasted to death. Attention, what are you? But we lost Roe earlier this year. We lost Tuvok earlier this year. Are you ever really, really, really dead? So that's the big question, right? So it's like, like soap. Like you never exactly. Really is she dead? Exactly. Or does she just have amnesia? Yeah. <laughs> or there's a twin. It's a little fitting, though. I think that Shelby potentially has finally been defeated by the Borg. Right? Would, uh, could we? Could we make that? Could we? Or make that is case? a Borg? Oh, this goes deep, folks. Mm. This goes very deep. That's what I. I, I completely buy that as a possibility. <laughs> Let's talk about the Enterprise D. Oh, did it give you the? It gave me all the feelings. Yeah, Aww. it gave me all the feelings. To, it gave me all the feelings when we did it. It gave me all the feelings when I took you over there. Yeah, that was the best. Will and I saw the set together Aww. and had our moment with it, which was the character of our lives for however many years we were on that thing. Wow, that's the thing. When I walked into that set, I was on stage eight again. Yeah. Wow. Was it as fun to have everybody there? Was it as it emotional to, it and complete, as meaningful as I thought it was? Completely. As fulfilling, and it was for everybody. I love that moment when Worf's like, well, you know, actually. I preferred the weapon systems on the E. Additional phaser arrays, torpedo. Worf. She is perfect. Another Worf. tribute to Terry Metalis. Yeah. Those moments of levity are yeah. one of the great secrets to making Star Trek really, really work. Johnny, we last saw you here in the ready room in episode three, which feels like forever ago. Mm -hmm. There have been some really big moments for Riker since then. Is there anything that really sticks out in your head from season three that was like an especially important Riker moment for you? Yeah, let me share this with you. Okay. You always bring this out of me. Okay. 
I was stressing about going back to work as an actor. I was stressing about learning the lines. I was stressing and stressing and stressing. And yeah. Because Terry had warned me there's going to be a lot of Riker, which blessedly there is. And the Riker is really good. And, mm -hmm. and it's. And um, I'm married to Jeannie Francis, as you know, who learns 20 or 30 pages of dialogue a night and has been on and off General Hospital for 46 years wow. and is a fantastic actor. And she said to me, when she was running my lines with me, you don't have to worry about um, pretending to be a leader or pretending to be a captain or pretending to be command, all these things. This is what you do. When you go to work, you lead your, your team through your day. Yeah. That's exactly who Riker is. It's who you are too. And it's who I am. But I needed reminded by her and it made my, it, it, it informed me in a way that was so helpful. Yeah. It's like Cliff Ball's note to you. Yeah. Only yeah. bigger. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. it came from Jeannie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of Jeannie, mm -hmm. let's talk about your shirt. Oh. This is important. I love this. Oh. Tell us the story of the shirt you chose to wear today and how Jeannie is involved. This is weird. I um, auditioned as famously seven times over six weeks to get Wild Bill Riker. And this is the shirt I wore to all seven of the auditions from meeting Junie Lowry all the way through to the final audition when I used to go to Gene's office with Corey Allen. And, and it became, I was so superstitious, like a baseball player, not wearing, you know, changing his socks, that I, you know, I didn't clean it, wash it. So it was virtually stiff by the seventh audition. And I've kept it for 36 years, and it was in my closet, and I was coming to see Will today, and I put it on. Gene said, isn't that that shirt that you wore, your Star Trek shirt? I said, yeah, that's why I'm wearing it. Hopefully, Will will ask me about it. <laughs> Here it is. That's it still fits. Great. That's the other part to satisfy. I'm so impressed. And it looks new. That's what Jeannie said it this morning. It looks new. Yeah. She said the shirt still looks good. It looks yeah. really yeah. good. I mean, that fits with contemporary fashion for sure. That's the other thing. I wish I could remember what I wore for my audition. When I got it, I remember being like, oh my God, I got that part. And she didn't oh. like me. I mean, that's <laughs> my most vivid memory is that I was sort of intimidated and then really happy that I got it. That, you know, I felt like, wow, this is big league. It made it feel big league for me. And what's so strange is when I go to conventions, 30 years ago, people would say, God, I hated you. You were such a bitch. That's such a great compliment, isn't it? So and I was hearing that. I don't hear that ever anymore. Think of how much the world has changed with never, nevertheless she persisted. How comfortable people have become with women in power who don't care if they're liked or not. Oh, that's oh, great. That's so the world fantastic. has changed. World so instead of you're a bitch, you. it's like you're a badass. I never hear that anymore. And I hear it from men. That's evolved. I thought she was a badass and you didn't care if people liked you or not. And you saw yeah. a solution and you forged your way through to pursue your solution, whether or not you didn't pass on and try to make the man come up with the idea. You just came up with the ideas and went for it. And I used to get a little bit scared honestly, at conventions 30 years ago, people were so vehement. Yeah. And now I never hear that anymore. Or what I hear is from older people, I thought you were, but actually you were really right. It's how so great. Yeah. So it's really interesting you how represent. the yeah. characters have grown um, in 30 years into being who they needed to become. But also the audiences have changed so much. Thank you, know. you, Michael Piller. Thank you, Michael yeah, Piller. For real. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Nobody ever says... You, yeah, you were right, but you needed to be nicer to him. I used to hear that. that oh, that's that's wow. That I have some hope. I have some notes to those dudes who said that. It's interesting. It's been um, really, really interesting. This really leads me into what is sadly my final question for oh, us no. today, and it is about Gene Roddenberry's vision and about what Star Trek kind of laid out, like almost sixty years ago, what we were doing thirty-five years ago. Star Trek to me has always been about moving forward and like challenging patriarchy, challenging the construct of gender, challenging the construct of racial hierarchies and all of these things that Star Trek has always been about everyone having a place and everyone being their very best selves and being able to do that. And that makes me feel like that is a tangible, example that we can all touch of how we as a society have moved that much closer to what we were trying to model 35 years ago. I feel like 
probably back then it was ahead of its time and she was a character who was kind of ahead of her time and the fact that she was so young. And, but you talk about in the same show that she reminds me of you when you started out. That was a big yeah. part of it is that what happened to that ambitious hothead? And I, th I, I think that both sides of the hothead, the ambition and the not caring about people liking you and then the person looking back it's really the story of humanity, isn't it? You know, and being a conscious person. Yeah. Uh, being able to look back at the past, being able to look ahead to the future, and what am I going to have biggest regrets about? Doing what I want to do or not, right? Good guest. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny. Yes, sir. I will have you back in the ready room as a director. I know that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. This is probably the last time you're here as Riker. No, 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 no. I need to be prepared for this. I do too, but I am in denial. Okay, you can continue to be in denial, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna say this thing that's really important to me. I love Riker. I love how Riker always saw Wesley the way you have always seen me. Right. He means so much to me, and I know he means so much to so many people. If this actually does kind of represent maybe the last stop of Riker and Wesley and all of that. I want to say in public how grateful I am and what a privilege it has been to be this enormous part of a thing together for 35 years. And I'm so happy that we are here in the ready room for this moment. It means so, so, so much to me. Thank you, Will. Thank you. It means that to me, too. You're good at this. <laughs> you were born to this. You really are. Oh, thanks a lot. Oh. Whew. Thanks for being here. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good show. Good show. <laughs> In this week's episode, several young members of the USS Titan's bridge crew are assimilated by the Borg. Senior officers of what other starship were also assimilated? A, the USS Defiant, B, the USS Excelsior, C, the USS Saratoga, or D, the USS Voyager. Don't boldly go anywhere. Stay tuned for the answer. Way back in 2151, or is that way ahead in 2151, we travelers experience time in a very different way than humans do. The first starship Enterprise, under the command of Captain Jonathan Archer, set off on its historic mission to explore the galaxy. In this week's episode, Starfleet commemorates those early missions with Frontier Day. And that inspired us here in the Ready Room to celebrate the legacy of the Enterprise NX-01 and its crew with this special tribute. Take a look. Space Dock, this is NCC 1701F, ready for ceremonial departure. Admiral Shelby in command. Copy that, Enterprise. Clear for departure. In Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 9, every Starfleet vessel gathers at space dock to commemorate Frontier Day. This special holiday celebrates the voyages of the Enterprise NX-01, the first Warp 5-capable starship constructed by human hands whose missions led to the birth of Starfleet as we know it. The legendary stories of that historic starship and its crew are told in Star Trek Enterprise. Let's go. In the premiere episode of Star Trek Enterprise, a Klingon named Klang crash lands in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Despite their Vulcan allies' concerns, the leaders of the United Earth Starfleet decide returning Klang to his homeworld is an ideal first mission for the fleet's new flagship, the Enterprise NX-01. Under the command of Captain Jonathan Archer, accompanied by his beloved Beagle Porthos, the NX-01 launches into the final frontier in 2151, 250 years before the events in Star Trek Picard. This first enterprise is made up of uniquely talented officers, including First Officer Subcommander T'Pol. This confirms that I was transferred to your command at 0800 hours. The first Vulcan to serve aboard a human starship, initially joining the crew as an observer on behalf of the wary Vulcan High Command. Dr. Phlox, 
the Denobulan chief medical officer who uses an otherworldly mix of holistic and technological medicine to treat his patients. Very nice. <laughs> Lieutenant Malcolm Reed, Enterprise's English security chief and tactical officer, whose Starfleet experience holds a dark secret. And St. Travis Mayweather, the ship's helmsman who learned how to fly starships while growing up on his family's cargo freighter. You're upside down, Ensign. Yes, sir. Care to explain why? When I was a kid, we called it the sweet spot. Lieutenant Commander Hoshi Sato, a gifted linguist who serves as communications officer and is the first human to learn the Klingon language. Engon, hook, ju, topa, gadam! Oh, he, he wants to know who we are. And Commander Charles Trip Tucker III, the NX-01's chief engineer as well as Captain Archer's best friend and confidant. Throughout the Enterprise NX-01's journey, the ship and its crew make contact with more than 30 non-human species, broker peace between Vulcans and Andorians, and Andorians and Tellarites, engage in several battles during the Zindi conflict. We're in range. Fire. And play a major role in the Temporal Cold War. On Captain Archer's final mission, he represents Earth by signing the Federation Charter, uniting many of the galaxy's different worlds under one banner for the first time. You wish you could tell them all that this alliance will give birth to the Federation. On Frontier Day, we look back at the building blocks of what we now know as Starfleet. Captain Jonathan Archer and the crew of the original Starship Enterprise, without whom future generations of explorers like Admiral Jean-Luc Picard may not have begun their continuing mission, boldly going where no one has gone before. Engage! In this week's episode, several young members of the USS Titan's bridge crew are assimilated by the Borg. Senior officers of what other starship were also assimilated? The USS Defiant, the USS Excelsior, the USS Saratoga, or the USS Voyager? And the answer is D, the USS Voyager. In the two-part Star Trek Voyager episode, Unimatrix Zero, Captain Janeway, Tuvok, and Bolana Torres allow themselves to be assimilated as part of a plan to infiltrate the Collective and help several drones recover their individuality. In the extremely rare event that you're not excited for next week's epic conclusion to Star Trek Picard, I have an exclusive clip from that episode that I suspect will alter your condition. The fleet has initiated an attack formation against Earth. Orbital weapon platforms have been destroyed, but Space Dock's defenses appear to be repelling the assault. For now. Planetary shields won't hold against that fleet. Where the hell is the cavalry? Emergency hails from both Federation and civilian ships have now gone silent. Apparently, we are the cavalry. The fleet is being controlled by the Collective. A hive mind with a single voice. The Borg are here. Mr. Data. Scanning, Captain. If space dock falls, there'll be nothing standing between an assimilated fleet and Earth. If Earth falls, everything falls. Every planet, every system. Long-range sensors are picking up a Borg vessel. Jupiter, sir. Lay in the course. Maximum war. Aye, Captain. Engage. Remember, my friends, resistance is not futile. I have really enjoyed our time together this week. Thank you for being here. And thank you to Jonathan Frakes and Elizabeth Dennehy for a truly wonderful chat. Next week, we will be exploring every angle of the series finale episode of Star Trek Picard titled The Last Generation. Wow, the series finale is a tough thing for me to say. Showrunner Terry Metalis and Seven of Nine herself, Jerry Ryan, will be here with me to talk through an adventure more than 35 years in the making. We're going to have some feelings, folks. Until then, I'm Will Wheaton. Live long and prosper.